Don't be afraid. Lock the doors. Turn out the lights. And climb into bed. It's time for Hillbilly Dead Time Stories. We have all heard the stories of haunted movie sets. The Poltergeist franchise was plagued by several of the actors dying during or shortly after the completion of the movie that they were in. Actress Heather O'Rourke died at the age of 12 from an intestinal blockage before Poltergeist 3 was even completed. Some blame the Poltergeist curse on the fact that Steven Spielberg used real skeletons in the pool scene. He didn't think that the artificial skeletons looked real enough and quite frankly, the real ones were cheaper. Another of the more popular curse movies was The Omen. Several strange occurrences happened to the cast members as well. The strange occurrences with this movie started even before filming started. Actor Gregory Peck, the star of the film, had to deal with his son's suicide right before filming began. Shortly after that, Gregory Peck was bound for London on a plane that was struck by lightning. Two weeks later, executive Mark Newfield's plane was also struck by lightning. These are just a few of the examples from the film. No film, though, has ever had the reputation of being as cursed as The Exorcist. You've probably heard most of these stories. On-set accidents, a mysterious fire, and even a murder took place during the filming of the movie. All of these things gave cause for people to believe that The Exorcist was cursed. And while you've heard most of these stories, you may not have heard the story of John Markle, but you won't soon forget it. In the bright light of day, the gray Victorian house that sits on the hill above Main Street in Little Rock, Arkansas, looks like any other nicely restored home in the historic Governor's Mansion District. The rounded shrubs bordering the porch along the front and the side show the care taken with the home's appearance, while a basketball goal in the backyard suggests someone who lives there likes to play. Nothing hints that 1820 Main Street was the site of a bizarre, horror movie-worthy crime 33 years ago that resulted in the deaths of four people. What occurred there shocked the city and prompted extensive speculation and media coverage. Today, it's a faint memory in the public's consciousness, although the deaths of John L. Markle, his wife Christina, and two young daughters have all the elements of a true crime novel or made-for-TV movie. Markle, 45 years old, was a depressed, angry man eaten up with bitterness toward his mother, Academy Award winner Mercedes McCambridge, whose approval he wanted desperately. He moved his family to Arkansas in 1979 when he was hired by Stevens, Inc. as an economist and a futures trader and was trusted with the accounts of the company's founders. Markle was also responsible for his mother's investments. The family created a life in the community, the girls attended public schools, and Markle's mother moved to Little Rock to be near her son. To all outward appearances, they were a normal, happy family. But the tragedy that unfolded in the early hours of November 16, 1987, shattered that image and brought Markle's personal and professional secrets and his inner turmoil into the light of public scrutiny. A thunderstorm raged throughout the night as Christina and daughters Amy Michelle, 13, and Suzanne Marie, 9, slept on the second and third floors of their home. At 2.30 a.m., Markle put on a Halloween mask, went upstairs, and systematically killed his family. Afterward, he phoned his attorney, Richard Lawrence, and asked him to come by his house. When Lawrence arrived at 4.15 a.m., accompanied by a Little Rock police officer, the house was dark except for a light glowing in the downstairs window. Finding the front door unlocked, the officer went inside and discovered Markle dead in his downstairs study. 
Lying beside him were two pistols as well as a blood splattered old man Halloween mask with a bald head, bushy eyebrows, hooked nose, beard, and mustache. A third pistol was found in the upstairs bedroom. The officer found 45-year-old Christina dead in the third floor master suite. Amy and Suzanne were dead together in one bed in a second floor bedroom. Later police officers concluded that Markle shot his wife three times, Amy four times, and Suzanne five times. It was also assumed by police officers that the two girls were in the same bed due to one being scared from the thunderstorm. There were no reports of the shootings from neighbors, most assuming that it was probably the sound of thunder. On the desk in the study, there was a handwritten suicide note bearing the date and time, 11-16-87 at 2.30 a.m., and it was signed by Markle. The note read as follows. Let it hereby be stated as true that I, John L. Markle, murdered my wife and two children, Amy and Suzanne, and then committed suicide myself. My wife had no knowledge or part in this. I think the evidence shall so provide. After calling his attorney, Markle shot himself in the head simultaneously with the two guns found beside him. He left a black briefcase with a note saying that it was for Lawrence. Inside were two letters to Lawrence a handwritten will that mentioned neither his wife nor his daughters, a 12-page letter to his mother, 64 $100 bills, a $5,000 money order, and assorted personal papers. The letter to his famous mother immediately captured the media's attention. McCambridge won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for 1949's All the King's Men. But what resonated eerily for those reading news accounts about her son's crime was that in 1973, she had provided the voice of the demon-possessed child in The Exorcist. Details that came to light after the tragedy further added to the horror movie feel that surrounded it. The Friday before Marco killed his family, Stevens Inc. fired him for embezzling and mismanaging funds. The date was Friday the 13th. Then there was the Halloween mask the acrimonious letter to his mother, the coincidence that a video of A Nightmare on Elm Street was found in the VCR, and the connection to The Exorcist. There was never any doubt that Markle committed the murders before killing himself. Why he wanted to commit suicide was evident after the circumstances of his firing were revealed. But despite all that's known about the case, why he also killed his wife and daughter seemed not only cruel and selfish, but also senseless. What made Markle decide that they would be better off dead? What pushes a father to kill his family? In this case, money and mommy issues drove a man to kill. John Markle's handwritten suicide note, signed and dated 11-1687 at 2.30 a.m., left no doubt that he killed his wife and daughters in their home at 1820 Main Street in Little Rock, Arkansas, before shooting himself in the head. But it didn't explain why. Letters the economist and futures trader left for his attorney and mother revealed his inner turmoil, the anger and the depression he suffered after being fired by Stevens Inc. for embezzling and mismanaging funds. Notes in his diary show that he was worried about his wife, Christina, and daughters, Amy Michelle and Suzanne Marie. I am broke and they are my children. They have no inheritance because of my actions, Markle wrote in the diary three weeks before his death. Christine says I have put my family last, and I have. On the night of the killings, 45-year-old Markle put on a creepy Halloween mask before shooting his sleeping family in their beds. The rubber mask, in retrospect, seems in character for a man known for his idiosyncrasies, such as wearing a leather Harley Davidson cap to his white-collar job. He owned a Lincoln, but sometimes drove a battered pickup truck that he and his girls had painted wild colors. Forensic psychologists cite numerous reasons why fathers take their families with them into death, among them loss of control over family circumstances, a belief that the children can't survive without them, and feeling overwhelmed and seeing no way out of the current adversity. Markle's life unraveled in the weeks before the murders. In October 1987, his employers placed him on medical leave, but local media outlets uncovered the real reason discrepancies in financial accounts belonging to Stevens Inc. and his movie star mother, Mercedes McCambridge. On November 13, 1987, three days before the murders, Stevens fired Markle. 
He had made investments for his mother and the company without revealing which were his mother's and which belonged to Stevens. When an investment was profitable, Markle put the credit on the McCambridge's account. Losses were assigned to Stevens' in-house account. Those losses totaled $5.2 million. There was no evidence that McCambridge knew what was going on. After being placed on leave, Markle came up with two plans for making restitution to Stevens, Inc., both of which required his mother's cooperation. But she wouldn't play. McCambridge's refusal to agree to either plan angered and frustrated her son, apparently adding to his bitterness about what he saw as a lifetime of indifference and affronts by his mother. In a 12-page letter that Markle left for McCambridge, along with a letter to his lawyer, 64 $100 bills, and other documents, he detailed his grievances. He wrote about growing up as a movie star's son and staying with other relatives and seeing his mother drunk and fighting with other co-stars. The letter revealed his desire for his mother's attention. Markle lamented that when he won several awards at college, his mother never seemed to notice. In none of the letters and notes in the Little Rock Police Department's investigative files, ordered released by the state Supreme Court in 1989, did Markle detail directly why he decided to kill his wife and daughters. However, the fact that he avoided a will executed in 1985, then replaced it with one handwritten and dated November 9th, indicated he had apparently made up his mind a week before the murder-suicide. The new will made no provisions for his wife and family. Steve Nowoski, Pulaski County coroner at the time of the murders, offered a theory in 1987 for Markle's crime. It was an act of macabre benevolence. He wanted to spare the girls the publicity. Arkansas business editor Gwen Moritz, who has studied the Markle case in depth and read every document in the investigative files, said Markle seemed to be trying to make sure the assets of his estate and life insurance policies went to pay off Stephen's debt. He believed he was punishing his mother and settling his debt at the same time. Moritz said, I think this was a really sad and psychological study of a guy whose mother was highly accomplished and he really tried to please her. He and his family paid the ultimate price for his obsession with that. Daddy 